Our next speaker is no stranger to these lectures, Brother Jess Whitlock has appeared several times in, on the lectures. He calls Duncan, Oklahoma home and has been preaching for 40 years. He served congregations in Oklahoma and Texas. He attended uh, what was then OCC and the, he puts it in quotes, and we know why, the old Preston Road School of Preaching. He began preaching in 1970, and then he attended part-time the Elk City School of Preaching under W.R. Craig. Uh, I might pause and mention something about that for those who don't know. That school existed for quite a while. It was a Saturday school and produced some, some very good preachers. They did a good job. Uh, people, of course, to go through a curriculum like that and spend several years. They have to be willing to give up all their Saturdays, sometimes to travel a ways. Uh, but uh, that school did a lot of good. Uh, later, he did uh, serve as an instructor at the Westside School of Preaching under J.T. Marlin, which also was a good school. He's done radio work, some debating, worked on the staff of Christian camps for 33 years. Um, he's been involved in mission meetings, seven states. His wife, Terry, began the fourth year of his work as the preacher in the Lord's Church in Evant, Texas. And we want him to come now and uh, speak to us. My assigned topic for this hour, what makes Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christian scientists, and Seventh-day Adventists different from other man-made denominations. When I looked at my assigned topic, I thought, well, two of these we've had lectureships on, books about yay thick, and he said, you're limited to 14 pages. <laughs> I mean... I appreciate so much Brother David Brown and the elders, the invitation to come and to be with you and take part in this uh, lectureship. All of the uh, lectures are, are just uh, great and a great encouragement and, and I appreciate that so much. Also, I want to uh, mention my appreciation to uh, Sonia West. I, I, I know I emailed her with a half dozen questions or better and then I thought, well, every speaker has probably done likewise, uh, so you need to uh, give her a great vote of confidence, appreciate so much her good work. And uh, I want to mention that uh, Jack and Brenda Stevens are keeping me in their home, and I appreciate so much that wonderful hospitality. I would be remiss if I did not mention the appreciation that I and all the speakers have for the ladies and all the wonderful food that they make available uh, for us, the snacks that are available even now, uh, that is a great work. And that reminded me of a situation that happened at home just a few weeks ago. One of our sisters came up after the service and uh, she said, Brother Jess, why is it that uh, preachers don't often preach on the subject of gluttony anymore? I looked at her and I said, Sister Ruby, that would be hitting below the belt. <laughs> Jesus Christ said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Matthew 7, 15. John said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, prove the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets are going out into the world. As we enter into this particular study, we're going to be talking a little bit about cultism, because when you look at each one of these that have been identified, we are dealing with man-made cults. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. A cult is an effort to get people to follow after a human leader. Whereas in actual Christianity, a determined effort is being put forth 
to get people to follow after our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word cult is derived from the Latin cultus. Mr. Webster says of that word, care, adoration, formal religious veneration, a religion regarded as unorthodox, a great devotion to a person, idea, or thing. Many of the uh, members of denominations and the interdenominational groups would not really look at these particular uh, cults that we're going to be looking at this afternoon and identify them as cults. But in the manuscript, I've listed a number of books that I pulled out of my personal library, and every one of these is identified and specified as being a cult. And after reading through a number of books about cults and these particular cults, one thing came across. There were literally dozens and dozens of earmarks that these different various writers had given that would help people to understand when you're dealing with a cult and when you're not dealing with a cult. So in the interest of time, and to make things a lot simpler for me, I have boiled this down to a very simple acrostic word that you will find in the manuscript, and that word is cult. The letter C stands for charismatic type of founder and or leader. Uh, in other words, they will usually exalt their human leader above the Lord Jesus Christ. The letter U for undermining the authority of the word of God. Oftentimes you will find that they have an inspired writing or usually a group of writings that they will actually insist are superior to the inspired word of God. And then the letter L for lying prophets and failed prophecies, which will be defended. One thing that has always amazed me about these cults is that you can turn to uh, proof after proof after proof of prophecies that were failed, prophecies that never came to pass, and somehow they will try to get around it and explain it away. But the test of a true prophet in Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 and following, will still take care of business. The letter T for teaching that stands diametrically opposed to the word of the living God. And once again, they will insist that whatever writing or group of writings they have is superior to the word of the living God. It was Edward Gruss in his writing who said, and I quote, a cult then is any religious movement which claims the backing of Christ or the Bible, but distorts the central message of Christianity by an additional revelation, unquote. An additional revelation. And as you will note in the four cults that have been assigned for this hour, every one of them has those so-called additional revelations. Revelations that they say you're going to have to take in addition to the Bible in order to arrive at the actual truth of God's word. So let's get going with, with Yahweh's witnesses. The letter C, a charismatic type of founder and or leader. They actually have two such organizers. The first, Charles Taze Russell, 1854 through 1916. He abandoned Adventism because he believed that William Miller had been wrong in predicting the date of the final return of Jesus Christ. And then he turned right around and announced the date for the return of Jesus Christ to be 1874. I mean, Mark 13, 32 seems to have no effect whatsoever upon these predictors when it comes to the final coming of Christ. We could talk about Billy Graham. We could talk about Max R. King. We could talk about Harold Camping and on and on it goes. And the words of Mark 13, 32 will remain true. The followers were called Millennial Donist, then they were called International Bible Students, and then they were called Russellites. Pastor Russell passed away in 1916. Judge Joseph F. Rutherford, 1869 to 1942, wasted no time in taking control of this organization. And if you'll notice in the manuscript, Judge is put in quotation marks. And the reason for that is that the closest that he ever came to a real judge was when an actual judge uh, sentenced him to serve time in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary on the charge of espionage. 
How about the letter U? The undermining of the authority of the Word of God. In six volumes that are called The Studies in the Scriptures, Russell claimed that the opening of the books of divine revelation will soon be completed. Unquote. Volume 2, page 189. Now, witnesses hold this seven-volume set of uh, their uh, uninspired books and hold them again to be above the Word of God as far as establishing authority is concerned. It's interesting that Russell made this claim. He said, never before had any person understood any part of the book of Revelation, volume 1, page 27. I wonder about, I wonder about John, the amanuensis for the book of Revelation. And more than that, I wonder about Jesus Christ, the actual author of Revelation. One thing these cult leaders do not seem to have any grasp concerning what is taught in the Bible is the Bible's teaching on the subject of humility. An entire lectureship could very easily be devoted to the new international, I'm sorry, that's another perversion the uh, non-inspired version, uh, that's not my lesson. This one is the New World Translation of the Holy Scripture. This 1971 translation became necessary for basically one reason. Jehovah's Witness doctrine could not be substantiated, could not be proven by turning to any reliable translation of the Scripture. And so they came up with their own false teaching in order to substantiate false doctrines on the Godhead, the resurrection, the time of the return of Jesus Christ, uh, hell, punishment, immortality, and a host of other subjects. They simply incorporated the text of Jehovah's Witness doctrine into their Bible. The letter L for lying prophets and failed prophecies are likewise defended. Studies in the scriptures reveals that Russell taught that the second coming of Christ would take place in the year 1874. That's in volume 2, uh, page 240. Mr. Russell also predicted that after 1914, that's almost 100 years ago, people, after 1914, there would be no more Freemasonry. Guess what? There would be no more navies, no more armies. Guess what? There would be no more trade unions. Guess what? Studies in the Scriptures, Volume 2, page 633. And how about T for teaching that is diametrically opposed to the Bible? In these studies, the pastor taught that the kingdom of Christ was not fully established. Now, why does that sound familiar? Max R. King and his A.D. 70 heresy. He was obviously reading some of these false doctrines of this false religious group. Pastor Russell predicted that he was going to write seven volumes, but he died before he was able to do so. He only wrote six. I wonder, did God forget to tell him that he was going to take him before he got around to writing volume seven? Volume seven is written by G. Fisher and C.J. Uh, Woodworth, Predictions of the Lord's coming were altered in the 1916 edition to have the date of 1914. And then to show you how feverishly they will try to defend their false doctrines, they said Christ did come in 1914, but it was an invisible coming. Doesn't the word of God say something about every eye shall see him? But that is the extent to which it just never dawned on these donest uh, to study the scripture, Mark 9, 1, Hebrews 12, 23 and following, Colossians 1, 13. The second quote I want to look at uh, would be that of unmarried elders. The letter C again for the charismatic type of founder and leader. That would be Joseph Smith, Jr., 1805 to 1844, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Mormon church was actually established at Fayette, New York, 1830. At the age of 14, Peepstone Joe claimed to have visions and revelations. September the 22nd of 1827 is a date when Smith claimed, and I did say claimed, the angel Moroni gave him the golden plates, which would later result in the Book of Mormon. But from age 14 on, uh, Peepstone Joe 
uh, basically hoodwinked and swindled his way through life. And the letter U for undermining the authority of the Word of God. The Articles of Faith are actually 13 in number. I want you to hear a portion of Article 7, 8, and 9. We believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. And guess who determines when it is translated correctly and when it is not? That's, that's not up to you and me. That's up to the Mormons. They will tell you when, when it's correctly translated and when it's not. Then we believe God will yet reveal many great and important things. In other words, latter day revelations. They keep on coming. They, they did not cease according to this man-made doctrine. Joseph Smith is actually the author of three volumes and all of these uh, volumes are counted as divine. I know that they are counted as divine because some years ago I opened my front door and there I had two Mormon elders and a Melchizedekian priest at my doorstep. And he happened to have in his possession this leather-bound volume, The Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. And he informed me very quickly that all three of these volumes had God's approval and that I needed all three of these in order to understand what is revealed in this word. Well, we had some interesting discussion. He got ready to leave. I said, you're not going to leave me without all of God's truth, are you? He said, well, this is mine. I, I, I had to pay for this with my own money. And I said, well, I can't believe you've just explained to me that this is what I need to understand, fully understand God's word, and you're going to leave me without God's word? This is my only trophy book in my library. <laughs> the letter U for undermining the authority of God's word. The article... Uh, I need to turn to the next page. Let's go to the letter L. Lying prophets and failed prophecies are actually defended. Myriad of pages would be required to deal with this one point. And that's why it is very important that uh, you get the lectures on Mormonism, that you understand that the, uh, well, let me put it this way. Brother Gary Grizel in the 2001 series of lectures of this lectureship dealt with the failed prophecies of Peepstone Joe. The 20th false prophecy. Did you hear what I said? The 20th failed prophet. In other words, 19 prophecies have all failed. This is the 20th one to fall. Relates to the final coming. And Gary actually uh, quotes uh, Joseph Smith, quote, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God, the Son of Man will not come in the heavens till I'm 85 years old, 48 years hence, or about 1890. That's on page 117. Brethren, you need to get that book. And you need to read those failed prophecies. And then that teaching that stands diametrically opposed to the Word of God. In the book, The Seer, Joseph Smith taught, quote, there were several holy women that greatly loved Jesus, such as Mary and Martha, her sister, and Mary Magdalene, and Jesus greatly loved them. These beloved women were his wives. Volume 1, pages 158, 159. When I read that statement, one word, and only one word, came to my mind. Blasphemy. Jesus Christ was never married. I defy any Mormon living anywhere on the face of the earth today to pick up the actual word of the living God and turn and give to me book, chapter, and verse authority for this nonsensical statement of Joseph Smith that Jesus Christ was married. I could, all the, the only thing I can figure is that he was looking to somehow soothe his own guilt-ridden conscience. The prophet so-called was prone with at least 44 different women. In my manuscript, I inadvertently put wives, that should be women. That one fact alone makes Peepstone Joe a profane prophet, a promiscuous prophet, a pitiful prophet, a perverted prophet, 
and really just a pervert. Mr. McConkey quotes this so-called prophet. I have constantly said no man shall have but one wife at a time. Mormon doctrine, page 578. Even the Book of Mormon states at Jacob 2, verse 24, Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Peepstone Joe contradicts himself, contradicts his own Bible. And then we have the almost church. The charismatic type of founder or leader is seen in Mary Baker Eddy, who lived from 1821 to 1910. She founded the Church of Christ Scientists in 1879 at Boston, Massachusetts. She is the supposed author of Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which was published in 1875. Mrs. Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddy became a hypnotic subject, I wonder why, became a hypnotic subject to Dr. Phineas P. Quimby, who claimed to be able to heal the sick without any modern miracle of medicine. He claimed to have the healing power of Jesus Christ. This time frame is uh, circa 1862 to 65. It's very important that you remember those dates. Then the letter U for undermining the authority of God's word. Brother Tiding says, and I quote, Mary copied Mr. Quimby's material. Mr. Quimby died in 1865. Uh, Mrs. Eddy's writings were published and copyrighted in 1875. Now, you can do the math for yourself on that. Alvin Jennings stated that her book is, quote, strikingly similar to a book authored by Dr. Quimby, The Science of Man. Mr. R.P. Spittler wrote in his book, and I quote, to Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, not Mary Baker Eddy goes the dubious honor of being the discoverer of the principles upon which Mrs. Eddy built her entire philosophical superstructure, page 52. To steal ideas from one person is called plagiarism. That's Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, to steal ideas from many persons is called research. And that's Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon. The letter L then for lying prophets and failed prophecies once more being defended. Mrs. Eddy's cult has to deny the reality of sickness, sorrow, sin, and even death. They deny the Bible's teaching on heaven and hell, the second coming of Christ, the judgment, they, uh, they contend that there is not going to be a resurrection body. Well, there can't be a resurrection body if there is no death. And yet, Mrs. Eddy had the audacity to up and die, December the 3rd, 1910. Teaching that is diametrically opposed to the Bible from science and health. And we will uh, spend more time with this particular cult because this is my assignment for Saturday morning. So I'm going to just uh, read the list and move on to our final point. From Science and Health, I want you to notice these teachings, and uh, all of the references are given in the manuscript. The Holy Spirit is divine science. Death is an illusion. Man is never sick. I remember moving to Evant, Texas four years ago scheduled to speak on the lectureship that year, and I was so deftly sick, I could not cross the road, much less drive to Houston. I, I was not in attendance. I was under a doctor's care that year, and, and yet, according to their doctrine, man is never sick. Have you ever been sick? Man is incapable of sin, sickness, and death. There are not three persons in the Godhead. Jesus did not die, hence did not arise from death. Lazarus never died. The material blood of Jesus will not save any from sin. Jesus Christ is not God. The Bible is not pure being defiled by material and moral senses. You could take just those 10 topics, you could take 10 speakers from this lectureship, and hold a whole lectureship almost right there. How about Sunday on Saturday? The letter C for charismatic type of founder and or leader begins actually with Will William Miller from 1782 to 1849. He became a Baptist preacher in 1834. Mr. Miller spent much, much time in the studies of eschatology. He was quite enamored 
uh, with those things concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. So in 1831, he boldly announced that the second event of Christ Jesus was going to take place between March 21st of 1843 and March 21st of 1844. He had 365 opportunities to be right. But he was wrong 365 times. Now, if that does not identify a false prophet, I do not know what it would take. Uh, he set another date, by the, uh, by the way, for the year of 1845. I don't know, maybe Harold Camping comes from this Miller family tree. But each time there would be this great disappointment and the people would become disenchanted. They would divide. They would go in different directions. And so each time he made a prophecy and the prophecy did not come to pass, then the group just dwindled and, and is still dwindling today, as a matter of fact. But uh, his follow, uh, James and Ellen G. White departed, and they started the new denomination, gave it the name Seventh-day Adventist. But they were still Millerites. And remember how we pointed out in the acrostic letters, C-U-L-T, that even if a prophet was shown to be a false prophet, they would still try to defend that prophecy? Well, according to the uh, book Seventh-day Adventism Renounced, D.M. Canwright is quoting Ellen White who says, and I quote, I saw that God was in the proclamation of the time in 1843. Ellen G. White lived from 1872 to 1952, uh, I'm sorry, 1915, came to be regarded as the, quote, voice of God in that perverted movement. They took the name Seventh-day Adventist originally in Michigan, Today, the headquarters is located in Washington, D.C. There are lots of strange things located in Washington, D.C. today. <laughs> the letter U for undermining the authority of God's word. Brother Harold Tidings has observed, and I quote, the Bible is claimed to be the source of authority, except when Ellen White has a prophecy or revelation, it is given precedence over the scriptures, unquote. My friend, that's like saying that the Bible is the final source of authority except when the Memphis School of Preaching has a better idea. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual 1990 has more than 300 direct quotes from Mrs. White. And then the letter L for lying prophets and prophecies are defended. Ellen White and others endorsed the 1843 era of Miller by explaining the sanctuary of Daniel 8, 14 and following was actually Christ coming. Now, if that's not strange enough for you, if I'm understanding their doctrine correctly, it refers to Christ coming to heaven and not coming to judge those who are on earth. And I'll tell you, I know that there are those of you who have done much more extensive research on this Daniel 8.14 passage and, and this particular slant than I have. But I'll tell you, when you start reading these tedious theories on how Daniel 8.14 uh, and this uh, sanctuary has to do with Christ coming to heaven, it's just about as interesting as watching metal rust. But it boils down to this. Miller and White were both false prophets and failed the test miserably of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 and following. And then we come to the letter T for that teaching that is diametrically opposed to the Bible. Adventism denies the immortality of the soul of man and therefore must deny Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 17, 1 through 5, Luke 23, verse 43, Adventism also teaches the doctrine of soul sleeping. And the doctrine of soul sleeping is simply that when you die, you're like the dead dog rover, you're dead all over. But this rejects the teaching of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Adventism claims that the Ten Commandments are literally binding today. Hence, Sunday on Saturday. Now the interesting, uh, interesting thing about their worship being on Saturday instead of Sunday is that they have to take all 
that is implied in the old law or they have to reject. And when I was living in uh, Kingfisher, Oklahoma, I would frequently make uh, trips into Oklahoma City and would go right through Edmond. And on my way passing through Edmond, I went by a church building and one day I noticed that the sign out front said that the Seventh-day Adventists were meeting there. And so I wondered how they could be consistent with the Old Testament law and a Sabbath day's journey, which is approximately three quarters of a mile. One day I was early for an appointment. And so I drove right to that church building. And I drove three quarters of a mile in every direction, north, east, west, and south from that church building. And I never came to a residence. I never came to a home. Now, now there's something not quite right here. According to the old law, if uh, you did that work on the Sabbath day and were caught, you were to be stoned to death. And I'm wondering if they were consistent with the teaching of the old law or did they all drive in Friday night and spend the night so they wouldn't violate the Sabbath day journey on the Sabbath day? And I wonder, was anyone ever stoned to death for traveling more than three quarters of a mile on the Sabbath day? Well, they must deny Paul's teaching in Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 27. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. God gave the Sabbath only to Israel. And it was a very special covenant. It was a covenant that he made only with them. Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 3. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, and Exodus chapter 31, verse 17. And according to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 13, the Sabbath law was not given until Mount Sinai. And then it was given only to Israel. There is not a cult or a man-made denomination in existence today that can qualify to be the church that you and I can read about in the pages of our New Testament. Whether you consider the four that we have looked at so very briefly this afternoon or myriad of others which could be incorporated in a lesson of this nature, they all have several things in common. And you can make this test and apply it to the man-made denominations. You can apply it to the cowboy church. You can apply it to uh, the community churches. You can apply it just wherever you, you desire to do so. But think about it. They, they all have these things in common. The wrong founder the wrong place of origin, the wrong authority, the wrong date of origin, and the wrong name. I thank you for the kindness of your time and your attention and add that time to my time Saturday morning.